Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Universal Furniture. Welcome to High Point Market. Uh, my name is Neil McKenzie, Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Universal. And uh, you're in the Learning Center. We've had a number of events uh, already and have uh, a lot more to go. Uh, but this is an educational area that we uh, developed when we moved into this building. And uh, we host a lot of different events covering a lot of different topics. Uh, we record them all. So if you do sign up for one and you can't attend, um, just sign up for any of them and we'll send you a recording. So that is something that you can take advantage of. Um, the showroom itself is very large. It's 115,000 square feet, three floors. Um, so there's plenty to see. Uh, and we definitely encourage you to see it all. Uh, you can check in at the front desk after the session. Uh, actually, everything in the showroom is tagged. So there's actually some scanners you can grab uh, at the front desk and you can go along and scan as much as you want. Um, and when you check out, just hand that scanner back to the front desk and you'll get an email with all the things that you scanned. It contains pricing information. It lets you know whether it's in stock, uh, all that stuff. So it just makes really your visit hopefully more productive um, in terms of your time. Please feel free to take pictures as well, but it's a great way to get some information. Um, this market, we have a new collection with Coastal Living called Weekender on floor three. Uh, highly encourage you to go check that out. Also on floor three is the rest of our offering with Coastal Living, including outdoor that's all in stock. Uh, floor two contains uh, Modern Farmhouse, Miranda Kerr Home, both of which are in stock. And then uh, the bottom floor uh, down here, you have our special order upholstery offering, uh, which right now is shipping directly out of Conover, North Carolina in six to eight weeks. So uh, very fast. And there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. Uh, and then downstairs, we also have the designer's lounge. Uh, so the designer's lounge is available to you all. We have some fun activations happening this market, including some uh, bubbles mixologist sessions this afternoon. There's the beauty bar if you need a hair touch up before the evening. So take advantage uh, of those amenities. And again, just uh, check in at the front desk if you need anything and they'll kind of get you on your way. So uh, thank you for taking some time to join us here at Universal. I'm so happy to have John McLean back. Uh, John and I, uh, I think last year, I thought he was like giving away money. So this is pretty close though, considering the weather. So uh, this is great. Uh, but John uh, obviously has a very successful interior design firm. Uh, does some coaching and I think offers a lot of insight. We actually just uh, talked on our podcast and John offered up a lot of great insight just in terms of uh, being more efficient, I think, in terms of running your business. So, um, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. And yeah, thanks you for joining us again. And we appreciate your time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Universal. You guys are so smart to come to these things because it's literally free education and it's just a wonderful thing that Universal does. And I'm not using a handheld today. It's hard to be very animated, <laughs> which I tend to be. Um, so I'm going to start just by asking you guys a couple of questions to see, actually three questions. So has anyone ever had a client that you signed on because you were so excited, the project was going to be so great, the house was going to be so beautiful, you could see it on your website, you could see it in the magazine, you could envision all the press you're gonna get from it. And you knew deep down that there was some sort of problem, that there was some sort of little inkling going on with it. And then you went ahead and did it anyway because you were just so in love with this project. And then it, that client turned out to be a biatch and you know, <laughs> and, 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 and biatch is non-gendered by the way. So male, female, that, that, I'm, there's no bias there. Anybody, anybody ever done that? Like just been taken? taken over by the project so much that you were just overwhelmed by the appeal of the project, right? I've done it. Uh, so that's called non-ideal client, okay? Um, and has anyone ever had a great discovery call? Has anyone ever had a great consultation? And then you did the proposal, you did, you felt so good about it. They're showing you pictures of their kids at the consultation. They're, it's all jiving. You send everything out and then it's like crickets. Not a word, not a thing. You're, you're calling, you're emailing, not a, nothing. You know, like anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the last one is, has any of us ever sort of wondered what's next in our pipeline? Like where is the next client coming from? Like we have payroll, we have, our rent to pay, we have, you know, all the expenses that go along with our business. Like, do we know what's in our pipeline? Do we know how many clients are, you know, upcoming? So these are things that we always have to ask ourselves as business owners. And so today we're going to talk about that very thing. The interior designer 
client journey, how to attract, close, and onboard every potential client. And it's every potential ideal client, by the way, not just every potential client. So here's what we're gonna learn today. How to define your ideal client, how to market and attract potential ideal clients, and I'm going to give you my client onboarding journey. So I'm going to give you lots and lots of downloads, by the way. Like this is, I actually have a course in my, I teach courses as well, so I have courses. This is actually part of a course, so all the downloads at the end of this, you guys can take a little QR code and snap it and just download your little hearts out because it's good stuff, I promise you. Anyone else having allergy problems right now? So if I, okay, so <laughs> if I'm like sniffing, sorry, I'm like, like my grandma said, I can talk the horns off a brass billy goat. So if I talk too much, if I talk too much, just tell me to shut up. Or if I sniff too much, just tell me to shut up. Okay, so this is me. Uh, I am an interior designer. I have offices in LA and Orlando, Florida. I am a business coach for interior designers and creatives. I have courses that I teach, uh, much like this, but also online. So you can go and look at my courses. They're kind of self-paced, so you can choose marketing or I have my contracts on there. Uh, have a design book out, which is I have in the back if anyone's interested to look at today, just released last fall here at Universal uh, Showroom actually. So very proud of that. I'm a cupcake connoisseur. So if anyone has any cupcakes, feel free to <laughs> give those to me. Dolly Parton, fanboy, self-proclaimed, love her so much. So much so that I had this art made for my home. And mostly I'm an advocate for all of you. Like I am you all, like I literally am you. I was sending out invoices three days ago. I was meeting with a client for the umpteenth time last week about trying to find this stupid Onyx vase for her dining room table that she has looked at a million times. So I promise you, I've been there, done that, and uh, I know exactly what we're going through. Okay, so let's jump in. So the client onboarding journey. This is the path that I've sort of routed out that I see every client going when they, from the minute they reach out to us until the minute that we start onboarding them. So first we have to market to and attract our potential ideal clients, right? We have to find them, we have to bring them into our company, we have to figure out who they are. Then we want them to book the discovery call, easy. Then they want to book the consultation, which is when we go to their home, or it's also a virtual consultation if you decide to do that. Uh, prepare the proposal. I do a proposal before I do my uh, agreement. And then you close the deal, which is the actual agreement. Then we move to onboarding the client. So as you can see, um, I love a good process. I love a good steps. I love to follow these steps every single time we do our, our every single client we bring on board, we have steps that we follow and I wanna make sure that we follow those steps every time so that nothing is overlooked and that we don't miss anything. And it makes the client feel good too, actually. So here we go. Marketing and attracting to your ideal client. But first, who is your ideal client? What is your ideal client? First of all, and this is a lot of words. I know we don't like to read words, but I'm gonna put this here for purpose because I wanted us all to see in detail specifically what our ideal clients are, right? So your ideal client is a client who find their needs fulfilled with the services you offer, your method of operations, very important, and who has an appreciation and respect for your skills and knowledge. More so, an ideal client is someone that you generally enjoy working with. Huh, interesting. Uh, someone who allows you to use your talents and expertise, huh, interesting, uh, in the most optimal way for project success and who sees the value in their investment for exchange of your services. They see the value in what you're bringing to them. So they see the value in paying for what you are bringing to the table for them. It's really important to remember this as we're trying to find the ideal client. Here's what they're not. So they're not just anyone who calls, who emails, who walks in your door. I say no, not just anyone with a pulse and a checkbook. That's not who they are. Uh, they're not the biggest house necessarily in the neighborhood. Uh, I have this whale here with the money. So it's not always the big whale. 
It is not someone who does not value your business model, your systems, your processes. So if you spent the time to come up with, this is how we work, this is how we onboard a client, this is how we work a process, this is how we work a project, and they don't care about that, they don't value that, then they're not your client. Um, they're also not someone who does not align with your beliefs or values. And this is something that I have found over the years for me that I tended to kind of push to the side in the beginning. I didn't really care about that part of it. I'm like, well, I can overlook this, I can overlook that. But the more I went into it, I realized like, no, I can't. Like I have to be myself when I'm on these consultations and when I'm in their home. You know, I'm seeing lots of private moments with clients. I'm seeing them without their makeup, you know. I'm seeing them with their husbands in makeup sometimes. It, does, it just depends. <laughs> it's, it's all secret, you know. We don't say anything, right? It's, it's all private moments. Um, who was your best past client? This is how you define your client, all right, your ideal client. So look to your past client and ask yourself, who was your best past ideal client? And your definition of that could be lots of things. It could be, did they pay their bills on time? Did they um, uh, respect my time? Did they respect what I brought to the table? Did they listen to what I had to say? Did they show up on appointments? Did they meet me at the showroom? Whatever these things are, look to these past clients that you've had and ask yourself, who is this client that you had in the past that you really liked? If you are newer or God forbid, you've not had a good client yet, <laughs> Um, ask yourself, how would you build this client? Like, what would you do if you could construct this client out of clay? If you could start from scratch, what would you do to build this client up from the ground up and, and literally list it out? Like, I want you to list out every single thing about them that you want this person to be. Sky's the limit and, and don't hold back because this is the person that you need to know because you need to market to them. It's really important. Um, what are the pain points? of your ideal client. So what did you solve for them? What, if it was um, like a family who wanted to spend more time together, did you figure out a way to, you know, resolve that issue for them to bring them closer together? What pain point did you resolve for this past client or what pain point do you see yourself resolving for this future ideal client? And then what personality traits between you and that ideal client aligned uh, and was there synergy? You know, like, it, was there a synergy between how you guys communicated? Again, was there mutual respect? Was there an understanding? What, what felt good about it, like, as far as the synergy and this energy and this chemistry that you had? So these are three things that I feel are just very simple, but also very important. All right, here, remember this. John McLean said this, by the way, okay? If you do not define your ideal client now, the wrong clients define themselves for you, okay? So if you don't tell your ideal client who they are in your company, they're going to give you all the definitions of who they are, and then they're going to expect you to accept that for them. So if, if you don't have this list of who you want to work with and who you want to bring into your company, you're gonna be bringing in everybody. And guess what? They're gonna tell you exactly how they want you to run your business. They're going to tell you exactly what time they want you to show up. They're gonna tell you exactly that they want you to text them on the weekends. They're gonna tell you exactly how they want to, you know, price their products. So remember, you need to have all of these things set into place because if you don't, uh, it's kind of that old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything kind of a thing. So you really do have to have these things in place for yourself to protect your company. Now, Marketing to the people. So you know your ideal client, you figure out who they are, and now we wanna to market to them. So here are sort of five ways that I've come up with to market to your ideal client. In person. Wow, crazy, right? I know, in person. Uh, and I'm not gonna, by the way, I'm not gonna dwell on social media. This is not a social media class. We're not gonna talk about that. I feel, I feel like that's a whole other Genre, we all know reels and all the things and the TikToks and all of that, but this is more about making you think outside the box and bringing things to light that perhaps maybe you hadn't thought of before and things that have worked for me over the years. So old school is the best school. Just like this lovely phone here, old school is the best school. Um, nothing really replaces in person. We're here now, right? Like we're 
communicating one-on-one. -on -one. Nothing replaces that. Like no matter how many phone calls you have, no matter how many video calls we had, Zoom, it, nothing replaces the in-person communication that we have with one another. So industry and organization events. I put this here because these are sort of like your ASID, your IIDAs, um, any sort of event that is administered by an organization that you want to be a part of. So yes, clients may not be at this event, but what comes from these events is wonderful, wonderful networking with industry partners that leads to other marketing that leads to things that your ideal client will see. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. So never ever um, underestimate the power of going to these industry events because they are really, really great places to network with peers, network with representatives, all the people who are in our industry. These are people who are gonna be at these events. Now, organization events, these could be local events too. So these could be things such as charity events in your uh, local areas, things like that that you want to. I don't do a lot of those personally, but you could also you know, donate your time or products to those areas. Show houses and trade shows. Has anyone done show houses? Yeah. So show houses are great. Uh, they could be expensive, as we all know. So show houses are good because you get to show house your display to someone. You get to show your design style to people. And you can actually stand there and talk about your room. You can talk about why you designed it that way. You can talk about all the products that you put into it. You can talk about all the thought process that went into that. And so as people filter through, you're able to market to that ideal client, hopefully, as they're coming through that room. Um, trade shows, these are sort of those iffy moments. So I've done trade shows before that have worked out well. I've done them where I've spoke. I've given out like design tips. I've done them where I've spoken and you know talked about just design in general. And then I've also set up vignettes before where I've actually set up an entire little vignette and which sounds kind of cheesy, but I've gotten one of my largest clients actually from passing through that vignette and sort of just kind of chit-chatting with them about why I designed it that way. So show house-ish, I guess you would say in that aspect. Um, and then vendor partner event. So this to me is something, let's say like a showroom that is an appliance showroom and they have lots of appliances there and maybe you use one of their appliances. So you go and they have probably 20 different appliance brands there. And you go in and, um, <coughs> excuse me, this allergies. Um, so you're going there and you're, you're seeing all your vendor partners and you're talking with them but you're networking with these vendors. So for instance, what happened to me once, I went to one of these vendor events and I was chatting with one of the vendors and he said, hey, do you need anything for your house? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe. So long story short, he ended up donating lots of products for my own home. And then I was partnering with them on their company. So now I'm on their website alongside Nate Burkus and a lot of other people. So now my face, and my company is on the website. So I'm sort of subliminally marketing to my ideal client just by being on that website. So it's kind of cool how these things sort of parlay into other uh, avenues for marketing. So it might not be directly marketing to your client, but it does work out that way. Email list, who, who does email marketing? Anybody? Nope, okay. Don't worry, it's okay, don't worry. So what and why? Here's what an email list is, in case anyone doesn't know. An email list is simply a list of emails that you gather from current and potential customers that would like to receive information, updates, discounts, and other details about your business in a digital format sent to their email box. Duh, right? Very simple. Here's why, okay? This is crazy statistics. 99% of email users check their emails every day, some as many as 20 times a day. Like, isn't that insane? Like 20 times a day. My grandma is, nine, she just turned 90 and she has email, if that tells you anything. <laughs> um, it's also often the first thing people do online in the morning. So before they do anything else, before they check their social media, 58% of the people who, uh, checked out the, the email before they checked their news, but also before they checked social media, before they checked anything else, 
they are checking their email. So email is just very powerful and it is very direct as well. So email is something that we definitely need to bring into our marketing. It is also personal because it's coming from you. So it's your voice. It is you saying what you want to say. So it's, it's very personal. You can say exactly how you wanna say it, when you wanna say it, without worrying about any sort of censorships or crazy algorithms from uh, you know, uh, Instagram. It's purposeful, you're having a purpose behind it. So whatever you're putting out there, you need to make sure that there is a reason. Don't just bombard people with a bunch of stuff. You need to make sure that there's a purpose behind it. And by sending out an email, of course you're going to have a purpose behind it. And just for the reasons I just showed you, it's very powerful. So it's very powerful in the fact that people are reading it and they actually are opening up your email and listening to what you have to say. How to create your email list, okay? If you don't have one, don't worry. I started out with zero, I'm not kidding. And I'm gonna show you a few very practical ways to create your email list. So first of all, a CTA, which is a call to action. Here's one I use um, on my website. So you can do something like this. This is basically just a little freebie. You, are, you guys are smart. You already know how to do multiple, multiple things. You, you could come up with dozens of giveaways right now, I, I promise you, on your own. So come up with something, create a simple little PDF and have them sign up for it. I have this on the very front page of my website. I get at least four or five a day of people coming there and as they're coming to the website, poking around, being nosy, looking here, maybe trying to sign up for a consultation, they can get the guide. And so whether they come to the website and move forward with a discovery call or not, I have captured that email and now I can have them in my database to work with going forward. So come, and I'll show you some software that I use to do this in a minute. But, but think about ways that you can um, come up with to, to give something free to people that doesn't cost you a lot of time. Here's one that I have called service opt-in. So if they do schedule a consultation or if they do schedule a discovery call with me, when they do schedule it, I have a link that links automatically over and adds them to my list. Now you can't do this without letting them know legally, you have to tell them that they're doing this, but when they sign up for a consultation on my website, which I do by the way, it's automated on my website. So I, I can show you that in a minute too, but when they do this, they're automatically added to my email list. So I never lose them. And if they, and if they do a discovery call and they don't move forward with the consultation, then I have their uh, email. I can keep marketing to them. Social media, here's another way. So if you have your link in the bio or if on uh, Facebook to learn more, don't forget about these simple little places to add a CTA. So give a little freebie away there. When they click on that, give them something to take away, something to remember you. And then again, they can click on that. You can have like, as many links on there as you want, but make sure one of those is an actual call to action, a CTA, some sort of goodie freebie that you give to them. So, so this is super easy that you can give to people. Here's one that you may not use. I, I love it. <laughs> it's kind of old school, but in your email signature, why not mark it in your email signature? So right now I have like my courses in there. If I'm marketing my courses, or if we're promoting a service within my company, I'll put that in my email signature with a simple hyperlink over to whatever we're promoting. And they can click on that and link right over to whatever we wanna promote. So you can freshen this up with as many times as you want. You can keep it updated, but it's just an easy way. And, and one other thing that I do, by the way, I give my personal, I'm sorry, I give my business email out to people that I think may do business with me. So if I'm at, let's say the car dealership, or if I'm at somewhere where I think someone may wanna have a little bit more information about my company, I'll give them my business email. So they're like, oh, johnmcclaindesign.com, what is that? And so it's another little marketing ploy that I use to, to get my name out there. Um, existing and past clients. So this one's sort of a no brainer, but as you're developing your email list, don't forget about the people that you've worked with that you actually like, <laughs> the people that you've, that know you, the people that are your ideal clients, the people that in the past that you had successful relationships with, 
So these are people that you should reach out to and say, can I add you to this new email list that I've created? I would love to add you to my newsletter. We're gonna talk about newsletter in a moment, but make sure that you let them know that you're starting this new newsletter or whatever you're doing and ask them, can you add them to the list? Because I guarantee you there's a list of probably 20, 30, 40, 50 people that you can add instantly to your uh, email list. Newsletter, blog, and website. I kind of group these together because to me, they, they all make sense together. First is the newsletter, which sort of coincides with your email list. Here are the perks of a newsletter. It is direct updates to your list. So you're literally giving them the freshest, most recent information. You're giving them the newest things if you were and featured in a magazine, if you have a new service, if you, uh, you know, like if you're going to speak, if you're in a high point, here's what you found at high point, whatever, you know, it's a direct update to your list. People love to kind of have that insider information and newsletters are the, the perfect place to do that. Enhances your credibility. You're speaking as the expert. So you're speaking as the authority. You're coming across as the expert when you're speaking to the people on your newsletter list. And, and the more you speak as the expert, the more people are going to trust you. And the more they're going to remember to call you when they want to hire you to do design services. It's also a great place to promote services and events. So if you have a new service or if you have an event that's happening, if you have a customer service appreciation or a client appreciation event, it's a great place to promote that. Um, here's one that you may not have thought of, test reaction to new offerings. So I use it as a, as a test base. So I'm thinking like, hey, I'm thinking about bringing out this new, I call designer on demand, where I come to your house for three hours. What do you think about this? And I'll take a poll from my newsletter subscribers to find out what they think about that. So before I launch it to the masses on my website, I'll take a little mini poll within the subscribers to my newsletter to see if it's even worth going. And, 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 and believe it or not, there are people who will answer you and let you know what they think about it, for better or worse. <laughs> Here is some of the tech you can use on your newsletter to help you do that. Some of these you may have seen, some of you may have not. Uh, MailChimp is a pretty well-known one. HubSpot is another one. Active Campaign, Constant Contact you may have heard of. Flowdesk is what I use personally, by the way. So um, I'm not a spokesperson for Flowdesk, but Flowdesk I like because it's prettier. And <laughs> for designers, you know, we want something that's aesthetically pleasing and it's also very easy to use. And it was created by graphic designers. And so anyway, that one makes sense for me. And so Flowdesk is what I use. Zapier I have on here because I use that to if someone signs up um, through Acuity, which is how I do my scheduling for our uh, consultations and for our uh, discovery calls on our website, if they sign up through Acuity, I zap over to Flowdesk and then they're automatically added to my newsletter list from there. So that's why I have Zapier on there. We use a lot of tech in our company. Blog, anybody have blogs? Just curious. Cool, do you guys, who updates them monthly? All right. <laughs> that was like a. <laughs> I heard the creaks as they went up. Um, blogs are great. Uh, here are some perks of blogs, and and some of these you're gonna see carrying over, by the way, from you know some of the other things, but it, it's still truthful here as well. So, blogs are great because they drive traffic to your site uh, SEO, which we're gonna talk about in a second. But they're so good because you can talk about whatever you want. You can put these keywords in there. You can basically just say what you need to say to bring people to your website. And it's sort of this back end part of your website that you may not give a lot of thought to in the beginning, but what happens is it, it starts to grow and grow and grow and grow. And then it just starts opening up all kinds of doors for you. And suddenly you're getting all kinds of people seeing your blog. And then it's almost like its own marketing tool in a way. So don't underestimate the SEO uh, power of your blog. It enhances your credibility, much like the other ones. Again, you're speaking as the authority. You are the person who is telling them why, you know, white kitchens are still relevant or whatever the case is. You're, you're the authority figure speaking on the subject matter. 
uh, it also leads to other opportunities. So I've written, gosh, I don't even know how many blogs now, maybe, maybe 200 or so since we started. And I would say out of those, I've had my staff write about half, by the way, and then I write some. And then out of those, we get some people reach out to us and say, can I repost your blog on our website? So with that, you get a link from the other person's website over to your blog, which is wonderful. And then sometimes I even get people turning my blog into social media posts on their website so, or on their uh, social media outlet. So they may take my blog that's like 10 ways to you know, customize your new construction home, and then they'll turn that into a blog po or a social media post on their, on their social media. So it's sort of a double whammy. But the opportunities that can lead from your blog posts are endless, especially if you're tagging other people in it. So you, know, you guys know how you tag people on your social media. You can also tag people, of course, in your blog. And they love, they love that. And they love the fact that you've, that you've added them to that. Um, long lasting results, it's there as long as you want it to be. Until you delete it, it's there. So the results just keep growing and growing and growing and the SEO as well just keeps growing. So blogs are fantastic. Here are some ways to come up with topics for your blog. Recent projects. So think about projects that you've done that you love. You can go into detail. Again, people love, 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 love behind the scenes. Here's how this project started. Here is how we, you know, developed it. We work with the client. Here's how we chose the colors. Here's how we chose the furniture. Here's the final result. People love to see that sort of migration of a project from start to finish. Seasonal topics, advice. So how to freshen your patio for summer, you know, things like that. I have to use AI in here because that's a new thing. I don't know if anybody started using AI or not, but it's a it's a kind of a good and bad thing, you know. It's 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 great that it's there. I don't think you should at the moment, like just copy it verbatim, but it's a good place to start if you're looking for just like a topic to sort of get you going, get your juices flowing. But remember, it's just pulling all that from the web. So it's pulling information that other people have said, but it's a good place to start for sure. And if you haven't tried AI, you know, artificial intelligence, I think you should try it. Um, your favorite paint, kitchen accessories, appliances, um, the public wants to know what we love. They want to know what our favorite things are that we use. They want to know, again, behind the scenes. So these are great topics there. How to choose those things, how to choose your, your cabinetry, your tile, sofas, plants, area rugs. So again, how-tos. These don't take us long, you guys. We could probably spit these out in no time because, again, we do it every day. And once you make this content, this content can start to roll over into your social media and you just repurpose it over and over and over. Um, this last one, business teaching moments. This came up on a coaching call that I did with a client. And so she was asking me a question about how do I talk about a sensitive subject with a client of hers that she didn't feel comfortable talking about in person. And I said, well, first of all, you just have to get over that and just say it, you know, number one. But second of all, it's going to happen again. You know, these uncomfortable conversations are just part of what we do. So I said, why don't you write a blog post that addresses that topic? And then you can revert people to that blog post if they have a question going forward and say, you know what, as a matter of fact, I wrote a blog post about this and you are a biatch and here is what I'm, no, I'm, just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, 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 scratch that. Scratch that from the record. No, 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 no. I wrote a blog post about this and you can read that here and learn more about that. But it's a good way to sort of, you know, nonchalantly for us, for those of us who don't want to, you know, be combative, so to speak, with people sometimes. It's a good way to teach people uh, in a way that you don't have to, you know, speak individually with people one on one. So think about that, you know, and you could. You could pile those up, right? I'm sure we all have a list of things that we hate talking about in person <laughs> that we could just sort of, you know, turn into a blog post. Your website. All right, website must do's. Your website must, 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 must speak to your ideal client. You have to speak to them in all the words, in all the copy, in all the images, in all the ways your website has to speak to your ideal client. So go to your website when you get home, read it, Think about your ideal client. If you're not speaking to them on your website, then you're missing out. 
You must have high quality images. If you have iPhone images, please remove them from your website. Please, please, please. <laughs> and anywhere else. I mean, they're okay in stories, but I just don't want them on your website. Um, because your website is representative of your brand. And when you are putting your website out there, you are building your brand. And everything that you do needs to be representative of the highest caliber of what you want to present to people. So if that's what you're presenting to the world, then that's what people are going to perceive from you. So just always try to have the highest quality of everything on your website, especially images. Um, it must be more than just photos, by the way. There must be words we can talk. So <laughs> we need to put words on there. We need to have sort of a reason for people to come to our website. We need to have, again, the blog is very helpful. We need to have tips. I have on the front page of my website, like a latest and greatest, here's our most recent press or whatever. So I try to freshen that up to keep people coming back so that they find something interesting and sort of think of it as a front page of a newspaper, if you will. So a reason for people to keep coming back. Your website should not be just a portfolio of pictures. That, those days are gone. We, are, we don't need to have just a lookbook anymore on our website. It has to talk to people. It has to be representative of your personality. It should be multiple pages. It should have a, a personality behind it. Don't just talk about where you went to design school. If you did, talk about like what you liked about design. Talk about like deep down feelings about that. That's what people gravitate towards. Uh, and on that same note, it must provide value to your visitor. So you can't just, again, have these things that they come to your site and look. They have to have a takeaway from that. So these CTAs, any sort of freebies, any sort of, you know, grab and go things. If they don't want to work with you now, they want to remember you in the future. So make sure that there is a value for people who come to your website. Okay, I'm not an SEO expert, so I'm just gonna hit the highlights of this, but at its basic concept, search engine optimization, SEO, is increasing your website's visibility in the organic search engines of major search, in search results of major search engines. But here's what I do know, right? Like Oprah. Know the content your ideal client searches for. So when you are, you've pinpointed this ideal client, right? You know who they are. You need to know what they're looking for online. So you need to know if they're looking for uh, larger family rooms to accommodate, you know, 30 people for entertaining. You need to know if they're wanting large patio spaces. You need to know exactly what they're looking for. And I know that sounds complicated to probably do, but if you know your ideal client, there's a sort of a simple way on Google where you can do this. You can start just typing in the first phrases of that. So you can type in, let's say, entertainment kitchen, and Google will finish the rest of that phrase for you. It will sort of finish out the rest of that sentence. And that's great because it's sort of telling you what people are searching for. So it's giving you keywords without you even having to finish those keywords on your own or having to look those up. There are plenty of companies that you can hire to do that, but if it's doing it free for you, then I don't know why you would pay for it. So, um, and then once you know those, you want to optimize your website and your blog with those keywords. So you want to put those into your website. You want to put those actually into the back end of your website, and you want to put those into the words on your website, which is why the blog is so important. Long tail keywords, has anybody heard of this phrase? So instead of saying white kitchen, you would say white kitchen with Carrera marble, white kitchen with uh, tile back, uh, subway tile backsplash, you know, more specifics in, in other words. So you want to get a little more specific when you are using SEO because long tail keywords are, is, is, is showing up more in search results now versus just the simple kitchen or, you know, you can type in kitchen, for instance, and get billions and billions and billions. But if you narrow it down to white kitchen with, you know, Carrera marble subway tile, that's going to lessen those number of people who, uh, the number of results and that people will see that. Um, links from other sites. So you, when you do your blog and when you start to, you know, get more known for your blog and for all the posts that you do, you need to start getting links from other people's sites. And as you write articles on other people's websites, let's say you write something for Apartment Therapy or Martha Stewart, they're gonna add a link back to your website. And the more links you have back to your site from other people's sites, 
the more Google loves you and you're going to start showing up more in search results. Rename your photos. This is so simple, but instead of calling it like 1245.jpg, like call it actually what it is. So think about the name of the photo, what's in the photo. And I know it's laborious to do this and I hate it too, but you do need to go through and change those out because it, it does subtly help with how you show up. Um, create multiple ads with those keywords. So I do, I run Google ads and I have probably five that I rotate because it doesn't cost any more to rotate ads versus just creating one ad on Google. So I create five different ads and I try to figure out which one gets me the most results. So one might be a kitchen ad, one might be a living room ad, one might be a bathroom ad. And then I look, go through there at the end of the month and I sort of go back to see which one was the best results for me. So you can create those multiple ads and it just takes you know about an hour to do that. But you add those keywords that you found from that first step in there and then you can test the results of that. Lastly, it does not have to cost a lot. I only spend 300 bucks a month on my Google ads, not ki no kidding. And I, and I get tons and tons and tons of results. Now, I've had them going for a while and, and I've I kind of honed it down, but you don't have to spend a lot of money to get a lot of results from your search engine. So just remember that. It's, it's, I know it's this kind of mysterious black hole that can be scary sometimes, but it's, it doesn't have to be. All right. Oh, we're running out of time. I told y'all I talked a lot. Okay. Book the discovery call. Okay. I'm going to go through these quickly. Keep it simple, okay? Don't get people so in depth on your discovery call. You want them excited. You want them to think high level about everything. You don't need to pull out your contract on the discovery call. Uh, I'm gonna give you a discovery call guide to success, by the way, to download for free so you have that, but which has my actual script in it that I use, so you can have that in there. But but just keep it very simple and keep it high level. Keep them, Keep the excitement going, you know, as they're listening to you. Um, automate, automate, automate. I automate everything. So when I have a discovery call, I, they, they go to our website and they book it on our website. They schedule it there with Acuity. Calendly does the same thing, I'm sure, but I like Acuity because it actually adds the questionnaire to that appointment. And then they choose which, um, which employee that they want to schedule the discovery call with from my team. And then they get an automatic reply and then they get a follow-up and they get a reminder and I don't have to do a thing. So it's like having another employee there. So I recommend automation. You can also kind of entice, AKA bribe them with a CTA. So you can give them sort of a freebie if they sign up for a discovery call, sign up for the dis discovery call and I'll give you this free download or whatever, you know? So it's another way to add them to your list as well as giving them something free. And then follow up. So if you don't have an automated system, I do invite you to follow up with them and to reach back out to them and sort of say, hey, just a reminder, we have a discovery call coming up tomorrow. You know, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, email, by the way, not a phone call. And this is my simple little post discovery call email that I send out. I'm gonna give you guys the download for this whole presentation, by the way, so you don't have to write all this down. But, but this is just something that I simply, I should have told you that from the beginning. <laughs> Did I say that? I mean, I did say that. <laughs> I did like, I liked all of you guys. So, uh, no, but I, I, I do, this is, this is what's sent out automatically from Acuity. Uh, so again, I don't have to do anything. Once it's done, once I schedule it, it goes out automatically. So that's the beauty of this. No, no team member has to be asked to do it. I don't have to do it. It just goes out. And then you can see there that I include on there a link to our menu of services. So right up front, they know like what we offer as a company. They know what services we offer so that they come to the call with some sort of expectations of pricing. Um, I ask them to look over, if possible, our portfolio to kind of have an idea of which project they're liking because, you know, if they come to us for a design aesthetic that we don't do, then they probably didn't look at our portfolio, right? So I want them to look at that to understand, you know, a little bit more about who we are. This is what I have um, at the end. I'll give you a QR code. You can download this. This is really cool. Um, I spent a lot of time on this. So this will give you guys a complete download of, of kind of how to make that discovery call successful. Book the consultation. Okay. This is, um, again, don't write this down. <laughs> 
This is what I send out after they schedule the consultation. So again, just sort of sets the tone. I'm all about expectations. I'm all about transparency. I'm all about clarity. I don't want any sort of misunderstanding. So I just let them know exactly what they're going, what's going to happen at that consultation. Uh, and then, you know, what they can expect from that. And I also include an investment guide in there as well to give them an idea like what certain things cost. So here's cost of furniture. Here's a cost like specifically like cost of sofas, chairs, you know, flooring, um, kitchen renovations, you know, all those things so that they have an idea. Same thing with the other one with the discovery call. Keep it simple. You don't, you can go into more detail, obviously on the discovery, on the consultation than you would on the discovery call, but still keep it fun. Keep it energetic. You know, don't go into, don't pull out your agreement again and go line by line. That's not what this is about. This is about winning them over. So the goal of the discovery call is to get the consultation. The goal of the consultation is to get them to sign the agreement later, right? So everything moves from step to step to step. Um, automate this, as I said, told you that before. Deliver immediate value. This is something that I really wanna hammer home. Don't just go to a consultation and shake their hands and meet and greet and measure the house and look at the everything. They need immediate value from this. They need to know that they're gonna leave that with a takeaway. So they need to have some sort of, here's what I would do here, here's what I would do there. Not a full design plan, by the way, just something that they feel that they got from that time spent with you and the fee that you charge. Charge a fee if you don't charge a fee for your consultation, um, the fee that you charge for that. So. I always let them know, like, I'm gonna give you lots of takeaways today, and then we're gonna do a scope of work afterwards. You can take that and run with it if you like, or we can take that and fulfill all of the design needs that you want. And then I say something like, you know, 99% of the people end up having us fulfill the design plan, but you, you're welcome to try it on your own if you want. So it kind of sets the tone for them, like, okay, you know, we know what we're doing. Uh, leave behind tangible information. This can be something fun, such as a, a water bottle, a notebook. It can be a portfolio. Right now, I'm actually leaving behind, since I have a coffee table book, I'm leaving behind my coffee table book for people, for, for them, which is kind of great. Um, but anything that sort of lets them remember who you are. So something that's just sort of like a, a week later, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, so-and-so came by. They were so nice. They left this for me. Uh, timely follow-up. This is again, important. Don't, it's not up to the client, to the potential client to follow up with us. It's not, it's not their job. It's our job to follow up with them. So if, if they don't follow up with us, if, if we don't follow, follow up with them and we haven't heard from them and we're mad at them, that's not, <laughs> it's not their fault guys. Like it's, they, they have a life, like they have things to do. We're the business person here. So Follow up with them, set a date on your calendar, whether it's a week. I do about two weeks follow up after the consultation at max before I reach out to say, you know, hey, I haven't heard from you. Are you, you know, any questions, you know, blah, blah, blah. So make sure you add that to your calendar. I have a consultation questionnaire as well for you in the, uh, in the downloads. Oh, I gotta hurry you guys. Okay, proposals. Okay, so just to mention, I do a proposal before I do the agreement. I do not send out this big, long agreement. I have a 26 page agreement, by the way, that I've worked on over the years and I'm not ashamed of it at all. No, uh, but I do a proposal and the proposal is sort of like this highlight of what they're going to have in the agreement. But the proposal is simple, it's clear, it's attractive. It has like, you know, pretty graphics on it. It has all the highlighted information. Of course it has pricing, it has deliverables, all those things, but it also still, you should still sell yourself and your company. You should still, you know, let them know why they should work with you because you're still in that selling mode on this proposal. You're still in that mode of like, okay, like they're not signed yet. So let me do what I can to win them over. Um, make it easy to receive. This sounds so simple, but I know there's the Sato and there's, you know, uh, HoneyBook and there's all the things and I know they're great, but I have found that clients just love a simple PDF emailed over to them and they can just open it up and I make it, I've tried everything. I'm telling you, I've tried everything except a pigeon delivery. I've tried everything. And the easiest thing that works is just sending over a PDF and saying, please reply if you approve this proposal. Wow, isn't that amazing? You know, so simple. And that's what gets the results every time. So make it easy for them to receive it. 
Um, provide next steps, give them a reason, or give them steps to follow at the end of it. So at the end of our proposal, I say, and next steps are one, two, three. So step one is this, step two is this, step three is that. So they know what they need to do, they know what you're going to do, and then once again, um, timely follow-up. Close the deal. So now, design agreement must do's. Keep it simple, clear, and transparent. Keep your design agreements very, very, very transparent. I don't care if you feel like you're over explaining yourself in your design agreement. That's why mine is 26 pages. It's because I do over explain myself and I want to over explain myself and I want to lay my head on my pillow at night and know that I'm not going to wake up to a weird phone call the next morning saying, wait, you didn't tell me that. I sure did. It's right in there. Um, so, so be very clear in your agreement. Also, I review it either in person or on a video call. Um, mostly video calls now because I have an office in Florida and one in LA. So I do a lot of video calls, but clients love it. It adds one more touch point and the more touch points you have along that sales process, the better. But I actually re review the agreement. I pull it up on the screen and I go, you know, paragraph by paragraph. And I highlight, as it says there, specific areas. I don't read things verbatim, but I do hit the areas such as pricing of products, pricing of uh, design fees, you know, things like that, that I feel like they would, you know, want to, to know. And I ask them any questions. It takes about an hour to review that. Um, and lastly, set up online signatures. <laughs> it's so simple again, but there's no reason you should have to, you know, have somebody print out something to sign to send back to you. There's so many online signatures services available now, DocuSign, um, HelloSign, all these that are, some of them are free. So your client should never, You'll get more contracts signed if you have them sign it electronically, I promise you. Okay, um, this is here because I actually am giving you my entire onboarding process download in the download section as well. So you have all my steps. You can either upload it to Asana, which is what I use, or if you don't use Asana, I have it in a Google Doc as well. And here is a bunch of software, a bunch, that I have tried over the years and just to give you an idea of all the things that you could use to help you in your client journey to make that faster, smoother, easier. You know, these are things that I've, I, some of them I liked, some of them I tried, some of them I didn't keep using, but most of them are very helpful in, in making the process easier for you and your client. So this is what's gonna come to you in your download. Uh, here's what we learned, if we learned anything, and there is the QR code to can download the freebies, which is what we really want, I know. Um, but you can check out my website, you guys, the, the designerwithin.co. You can check out all my courses, my actual agreements are on there as well. I'm doing a, a discount code for anybody who wants to purchase any of the courses. Once you buy them, you have the course for lifetime. It's a complete lifetime course. You can buy them individually, marketing, sales. Um, I have one about how to price your products. I have a designer calculator that literally calculates your design fee for you. So uh, I have everything on there uh, as well. And if anyone's interested, I do have copies of my book as well after. I'll be, I can sign those for you if you'd like. So that is it, everybody. Thank you for coming.